Welcome back to The Big Show. It's Alex Belfield talking to the biggest stars, and there's no man more successful than Duncan Bannatyne. How are you? I'm great, thanks very much. Nice to meet you, and I feel kind of not worthy, because there I was last Sunday in my one-bedroom bedroom, bedroom, sat reading the Times newspaper, and I pick up the rich list, and there you are in it. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I like to consider myself as being a successful entrepreneur who's uh, achieved things in life rather than being rich. What's fascinating about you, though, you still seem as humble as you ever were. And reading this new book, which you brought out, which basically is helping people to understand money, which is, I think, most people's problem right now, if they've got it, how to manage it. And if they haven't got it, how to make more of it. You seem to still remember where you came from, which wasn't a wealthy place, was it? That's right. But, you know, I was penniless at the age of 29. So I was poor for a long, long time, almost half a life. Um, but, you know, as I've, as I've gone around the country doing public speaking and, and, and I sit in my office and get some emails, a lot of people start asking me about money and financial things. And so I've started to realise that the people don't even think about it properly. You know, and they should really sit down, say once a month with a partner, go through the books, look at the bank statements. It's amazing how many people don't check the bank statements. And, you know, this idea came to me about just over a year ago when I checked, and I don't always check them either, I check my credit card statement. And I found out that a club I was a member of in London, a grocer club, had taken somebody out of my account. I checked back, and he'd been doing it for over a year, and I hadn't noticed. If I hadn't noticed then, it would never have stopped. They gave me the money back, but it could easily happen to anyone. Last night I was sat at home reading your book ahead of the interview today, and a buddy of mine came round, and I said to him, you know you were at that gym six months ago. Are you still at the gym? Yeah, yeah, I forgot to cancel it. I said, well, how much are you paying? He said, £42 a month. I said, you can afford to waste £42 a month and then you have the cheek to say you can't afford to come out for dinner. It's funny how people put things aside that actually could change their lives. Yeah, you definitely should not be going out for dinner. You should be joining the gym and paying the £42 a month. Well, it's not expensive. And in actual fact, the industry is 1% up on the last year in new membership sales. And, you know, most people who tell you they've been a member of a health club for six months and haven't gone, forgotten to cancel it, are actually not telling you the truth. The statistics show that. About 92% of my members use the club once a week at least. You're a businessman that's made your money out of getting people into gyms, but it is kind of annoying because you have to turn up. Health club members are using the clubs more than what they ever did because they don't have to pay any extra and if they cancel dinner once a month, that, that covers the cost of the fees. I didn't intend on talking about this and we just got on it by accident, but are you worried that people won't have the money in this economy to go to the gym? Because it is a few dinners on the table, isn't it, a month? No, because, you know, we, we're actually um, 3% of them turnover from last year and new memberships are up 1% and everybody in, in the industry is saying the same thing. All right. Moving on back to you and your childhood, I was reading about your family and where you came from, humble beginnings, and, and then just a few shrewd decisions. And it seems to me people like yourself are very canny. You make certain decisions. I'm sure you've made mistakes as well. But isn't it seeing an opportunity when it's presented to you? Yes, but... Everybody sees those opportunities more than once in their life. I, I did, and I've turned them down before, and I've took the opportunity, gone into business, and, and built up a, a, a great business. And anyone can do it, and everyone will have the opportunity. It's whether or not they take the opportunity and go out and do it. Now, what I was reading about you was your first venture, which was an ice cream van, one ice cream van. That then turns into 100 ice cream vans, and next you're making money. How do I do that then? Do I look for something that's missing in a market, start small, and then grow slowly? Because it seems to me that what businesses try to do these days is grow very quickly and then end up going bust. You know, you answered the question yourself very, very correctly. That's why I did. Started with one, build up slowly. I mean, some people will go out and they want to have the biggest hotel chain and they're going to go and get money from uh, this equity provider and this bank. What's the point? Get one, own it, run it properly, open a second one. It doesn't matter what the business is. Take your time and build them up. Fantastic. You know what you do. Go and do it. I was watching Larry King Live the other week and Donald Trump was on. He's brought out a book like yours, which is basically facing this economy head on. He says there's no better time right now to invest in the right business. He's absolutely right. Um, you, you now's the time to go out and buy property or look for property. You know, there was a recession in the early 90s when I was building my first nursing homes. And because of that recession, I was able to get builders and architects fairly, fairly reasonably, fairly cheaply, if you like. And the same is happening now. So if you can buy some land now, start building things, it's a great time to do it and, and build, sell the thing you're building now in about a year's time. What was interesting about reading your book and your biog is you went from ice creams, which everybody loves, to nursing homes, which everybody needs. You've been quite shrewd in looking at what society needs and then giving them a service. That seems to be the key to your success. Am I right in seeing that? Yeah, that's correct. You know, I, I went into the ice cream business because really I was a 
low cost entry into business and, and I did that for five years and I had six ice cream vans at the end of it. Now there's still some people who had one ice cream van, when I had one ice cream van, who still drive one ice cream van now, who didn't bother to go and move on and expand. Um, and I started nursing homes because Maggie Thatcher, God bless her, she changed the rules. And it was all over the papers and the news about how it was an expanded business for the private sector. So it was easy to do. And then children's day nurseries was the same thing. The government was changing the rules again. Started developing children's day nurseries. And eventually sold that company because um, I got a great offer on it. And the health clubs, that was it. Everybody's looking at the health clubs. Fantastic. I know the big thing now, the most expanding industry in Great Britain, as far as I'm aware at the moment, is the industry I'm in now, which is the spa and the, and, the, and the well health massages and facial business which again goes against the grain of what we're being told I've just been doing some interviews this afternoon about the West End and it seems to be doing okay what we're told by the government is oh nobody's got any money nobody's spending you wouldn't think a spa treatment is something that people would be investing in yet you're telling me they are they are and and you know um, I, I, I sell a lot on lastminute.com and I was talking to them the chief executive and he says they're, it's their fastest growing business the fastest growing way in their business they're 36% up we are about 30% up which is absolutely terrific but you know I don't think it's the government that's telling you people are not spending I think it's the newspapers that are telling you that but you know the other thing is as well is I mean I said in GMTV about six months ago and, and, and the people on there laughed at me I said you know people will, will, will cancel holidays abroad and spend money in, in Great Britain before they'll stop gym membership and they said, that's, that's crazy. But, but they're doing it. It's, it's happening now. People are staying at home and, and visiting um, resorts around about England, which is fantastic. You opened this spa last year. It was expensive. It was an incredible amount of money. And people said to you at the time, why are you doing this? Why don't you back out and pull out? Because you're never going to make any money. And you're telling me you are. Is part of your success in having your own mind and never letting anybody distract you with their opinion for whatever reason they're giving you that opinion? Absolutely, you've got to. If you if you're focused on something and you know it's right, you've just got to keep going at it all the time. That you know that's bad now. Saturday nights we've got a waiting list. We cannot cope with the customers on Saturday night. We're actually sending customers to our other hotels in, in the Hastings area. So now I know I'm right. But um, yeah, you just got to go and do it. You've got to believe in it. And believe in yourself. This is probably a question you don't want to answer. But what is the thing that got away from you that still bugs you? Is there a business opportunity you now wish oh, I should have done that? Yeah, the one on Dragon's Den that got away from me that I wish I invested in was uh, a, a, a fantastic guy called Rob Lowe who had a, a suitcase called the Trunky with wheels for the kids to sit in. And the first time that I was asked that question and I said it was the Trunky, Rob sent me a Trunky, but it's called the T out and put a D, so it's called the Donkey. But the thing is, every time I go to the airport, if I'm waiting to go on an easy jet from Newcastle to my villa, there's somebody in the queue with a Trunky and they look down the nose at me, so superior. You know, <laughs> you got it wrong. <laughs> Every time. Just notice there you said flying easy jet. What happened to the private jet? I don't use private jets because, you know, they just burn holes in the atmosphere and I've got to think of my children in the welfare of this world. But, you know, it's so easy to fly from Newcastle, which is 20 minutes from my house to my villa. I can do it in four hours from my house, house to the villa. It's fantastic. It's a great service. How hard do you work now? Because you're in a position where you never need to work again. I think it's fair to say that you could sell up today and walk away very happy and still afford your flights to your, your villa, wherever it may be in the world. What drives you to get out of bed in the morning today? I think the same as drives all entrepreneurs, enjoyment. We love our lives and we love the business. And we love the, the wheeling and dealing and all those things. And, and, you know, all of us feel the same, that we're never going to give up. We're never going to stop until the day we die. When was the point when you thought, I've got enough money now that I don't have to worry, or have you still not arrived there? Uh, that would be when I sold Quality Care Homes. It was a public company, and I sold it in 1997, and I sold it for £46 million. I, I, I pocketed £25 million. And that day, I did consider... Well, I had three options. I could go and live in Monte Carlo, or I could pay 40% tax, or I could start new businesses. I went to live in Monte Carlo for two days, and I thought, oh, I can't do this, I hate it. <laughs> I really didn't want to pay the tax, and so I decided to start new businesses. And, and that's what I've done ever since, and it's been um, really, really great. And, and I decided that because it's what I wanted to do, it's what I enjoyed. You appear to be the kind of person that would get bored if you were sat on a beach all day, every day. I would absolutely get bored, you know. I mean, I, I, mean, I love sitting at the villa. I spent uh, you know, probably about 12 weeks a year at the villa, but I do sit beside the pool with my Blackberry. You know, but it's still great. I watch my kids in the pool, I jump in the pool with them. When I, come, I don't rush to it if it rings, you know what I mean? I just go and see it when, uh, occasionally and just check it every so often. And the kids, how do you make sure they don't get carried away with daddy's money and have some purpose in life other than spending it? That's a continual thought process, um, constantly. You know, my little boy Tom, who's seven, he came home from school um, a few weeks ago and he says, one of the other lads at school, Matthew, had this pair of um, trainers that were very expensive. He says, Dad, why haven't I got a pair? Because we're richer than him. 
And I looked down at my son, Tom, and I said, Tom, what you have to understand is we're not rich. I'm rich. You're poor. Now, for you to make enough money to buy expensive clothes, you're going to have to work very hard and start your own business when you leave school. I'm leaving all, all my money to the poor people, and you're not getting a penny. And he says, OK, that's what I'll do then. And he accepted it. Can we talk a bit about the government? Because what was interesting reading about you is how you switched. How are we doing? Where are we at? How is the economy? And what should we be thinking at this point in 2009? Well, I think we have to realise this is a very, very challenging times. And, you know, I think what happened was that the banks were lending each other money all around the world. And every time they moved a bit of money and got an extra 1% or quarter percent, somebody took a commission. And, and these are the, the brokers that sit in these big offices. And then one day, the money was moving around, and they just ran out of money. And all of a sudden, nobody had any money to pass around. Simple as that. And it's a scary thing. This is a very, very vicious um, situation we're in. And um, we've got to think very hard about getting out of it. And I think, you know, Gordon Brown is probably the best person to get us out. But the trouble is that Gordon Brown is in the situation where his, his party's been in for 10 years, and we always have this, whatever part is in, in 10 years' time, they have the same problem. Maggie Thatcher had the same problem. And the reason is because there's no way out for a prime minister. We should have fixed terms, maximum of eight years, or make it 10 years, and then the prime minister's got to stand down. Simple as that. Two terms of office, maximum, and we solve a lot of these problems. Do you think Gordon is done? I don't think he's done, no. I think he's, he's still fighting. He's got great fighting spirit. And uh, actually, I'm, I'm going out to see him on and, and Sunday and have lunch with him at Checkers. And uh, we chat to him then, but no, it, I mean they've got. It's very resilient, and so is his wife. So I think I think I think they've. Um, I think they've still got a lot to do for the country. It seems like they're imploding at the moment. They're turning on each other. That's not good for the party, is it? It's not good for the country because what happens is that look, if I build a business and my finance director is no good, I fire him and he goes and works for someone else. The managing director. If, I, if you're in government and you're the prime minister, and somebody in the front bench isn't doing very well you fire him, he goes and sits in the back bench and the only way he can get back in the front bench is to get rid of you, the Prime Minister. So they revolt against you and that's what's happening, that's what continually happens. You have your Blairites, your Brownites and Hesitanics and, and it all of them conspire against you and they're really, in a way, conspiring against the country, although they don't know that. So a fixed terms of government is the only way to solve it. Who do you think is responsible for this? Is there any one body or person who has created this international crisis? The credit crunch. Do you know, I'm going to say something that's very, very controversial. A lot of people will slag me off for this. But you are, and I am, and the listeners are. We're all guilty of the greed. It's OK saying the bank should have lent the money at 90% or 100% mortgages, but we all borrowed it. And we all sat in cars and at dinner and in trains. We said, I bought this house for 120000 it's worth 150000 We all did it, every single one of us. We're all guilty of that complacency and that little bit. Greed is a harsh word, but it's a bit of greed and a bit of complacency. You know, things are good and they're not going to get worse. But was a, there was a few, a few warning signs and we never heeded them, none of us. Have we learnt our lesson? I hope we have. I hope, you know, coming out of this recession, we'll become a better society and we'll be nicer to each other and be more generous to each other. Um, charities are suffering at the moment because they're not, they're not um, raising money where people are cutting back. And uh, particularly charities who did fundraising do and people would go and they would bid for an auction prize and get drunk and bid too much for it. They're suffering in that fundraising now. But um, hopefully we'll start to think about those other people that are suffering worse than us in the coming years, or the coming months, hopefully. Most people got to know you, firstly, through your name, which is on the gym. And it struck me, I was reading in your bio that originally you wanted to be an actor and tried at it. Is there a side of you that has a big ego that you want your name on the side of a building all across the country? Yes. <laughs> and I don't blame you. If I had your type of money, I'd do it as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, about this book, um, it comes off the back of your success on Dragon's Den. That's where we got to know you, of course. That's been a huge success for you. I haven't seen any backlash for anybody who's involved. It's not a reality show show um, that ends up kicking everybody in the privates is it yeah it's a good story show because everybody gains by it you know even people who come up with uh, you know i tell you what's happened this time actually we're, we're in the middle of filming now and it's amazing how we've all got someone in front of us who's put a lot of money into a business or an invention which is completely crap and useless and we're all being a bit sympathetic and saying i'm sorry you know you've mortgaged your house you've this but this idea is worthless you've lost your money you know and that's happening too often now. Is it fun being you, very finely? I mean, you've got the books, you've got the money, you're on the rich list, you've got successful businesses, the ventures that everybody told you 18 months ago are going to fail are succeeding. You're in a good place right now, aren't you? 
And don't forget, a fantastic family, six fantastic kids, and a wonderful wife. But yeah, um, it's fantastic being me. I love being me. And um, I've no regrets because everything I did in my life, including spending a few days in Berlin and, and getting kicked out of the Royal Navy, made me who I am, and I'm happy with who I am. So yeah, it couldn't be better. You give an awful lot to charity, and you, you're very big on thinking of others, aren't you? Well, I, did, I got involved with, with um, children in Romania who were tied to beds who were HIV positive and some children in, in, in Africa. And so I, I, I fund their lifestyles, if you like, uh, at the moment. And that's very easy to do when, you, when, when you're pretty wealthy. So, that, you know, and I'm actually uh, a former Rowan charity and we'll, we'll be opening um, the first um, Casa Banatan in, in Scotland very, very soon. So that'll be terrific. Congratulations on being you. The new book is in your stores now. It's called How to Be Smart with Money. Let's give a top three things then. If I'm sat there now listening, thinking, I haven't got any money, but you've got an income, you could be smarter. What are the three things we should be doing to be smarter with our money? Well, the first thing, you take it in three steps. The first step is to sit down, look at your finances, get a bit of paper, write down what's coming in and what's going out, and then see what you can knock off the going out one and see if you can save a little bit. doesn't matter how low it is, save a little bit, and then you can move out of the position you're in. Number two is once you understand it, Plan your life, look at the practical applications. Do you need a mortgage? Do you need um, a pension? Do you need savings for any specific thing? And then start planning your life that way. And then number three is once you've done that, and especially if you're in a relationship and you're going to have kids, remember, you both might be working today. If you have kids, two years down the line, one of you might just be working, your income goes down, your expenditure goes up massively with kids, so you have to sit down and write your five-year lifetime plan. We do that in business. We're at a five-year business plan. There's no reason why you can't write a a five-year lifetime plan how your finances are going to work. Tarquin's telling me we're out of time and we've got to go. Just as a private thing, we'll edit this out when it goes out, but I'm thinking of launching Bannertine FM and I only need 20 million. I'll do the breakfast show and then we'll play music the rest of the day. I only want between, I don't know, 200,000 and 500,000 a year. Will you stick us a few quid to make this happen? Because I think it could be big. I invested in a radio station once. It was called um, A1FM, and um, it was the worst radio station you've ever heard. <laughs> My kids used to get in the and say, switch it off, Dad, switch it off. I'm not listening to that. <laughs> that was really terrible. Eventually, we relaunched, relaunched it, and we called it Alpha Radio. I wanted to call it um, Crap Radio, <laughs> <laughs> a crap FM, but the rest of the board wouldn't have it. It was that bad. I think I worked there once. <laughs> Duncan Ballantyne, thank you very much for talking to me. I presume that's a no, then. That's a no. <laughs>